Okay. Um, my talk's a follow-up from um, what was called a mashup at the Mitchell, which is part of the State Library of New South Wales. Um, May has been information, um, information Awareness Month, so the idea is um, government institutions have been releasing data and what the libraries did was release a whole lot of information they had in their collection. And this, in the case of the State Library of New South Wales, it's a whole lot of photographs and they released it under a um, attribution non-commercial share alike 3.0 license. So you can take it away and mash it up in different ways. Um, I also have an interest in particularly the history of Annandale, which is pretty close to Sydney. Um, and what I did was I took a whole lot of photos from their collection um, that they'd released and put it into a film strip and, th and all, did it all with GIMP. So what we have here is Sorry, they're not all photos, some predate photos. So it's called Sydney 1788 to um, 1938. So the photo, that's the photos they released. Um, and so this, this is Sydney Cove. So these are the drawings um, from the first fleet collection. So people did sketches of what it was like. Uh, so in this scene, you sort of, this is a meeting with the people from the first fleet and Aboriginal women on the foreshore there. And one of the things, probably can't see, there's actually, if you, this is online, so if you can search for Sydney 1788 to 1938, or um, you'll, you'll find it as a web page. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's, a bigger, there's a bigger version here of, of the photos, but I haven't, <laughs> except this is, of course, the drama that, um, yeah, it's it's because it's so wide. <laughs> it, 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 um, Click on it or just zoom in. Click on it? Yeah. No. Black cover on it, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, okay. So there's some the image is slightly better and um, if we go right which I can't actually see, you can see that it goes from basically first fleet um, and you can notice that they, the first one, there's the trees coming right down to the foreshore and then a little bit's being cleared in the second shot and then there's a map of the foreshore. If, um, if you know Sydney, um, that's, uh, that's where Circular Quay is and you'll see, if you've heard of the tank stream, you can see where the tank stream's shown there and then there's sketches of um, the early um, the vegetation, the native plants. That's one of my other fantasies is um, into local provenance vegetation. So that was quite exciting for me. Then we kind of move along, and there's all the maritime trade um, stuff happening, and the construction of Sydney and George Street, Mort, um, Mort um, wool, wool um, stores at Circular Quay, and then moving along, there was an international exhibition held. Um, in Sydney and they built the Garden Palace in the Sydney Botanical Gardens in the corner on Macquarie Street across from the art gallery there, um, from the library. And so they had an exhibition and then the building burnt down. So they built it very quickly and it burnt down three years later. It's a nice rose garden. <laughs> hey? It's a nice rose garden. Is that the site? Yes. Okay. Um, but the gates are still there if you want to see it and these are the early shots of, the, of Circular Quay um, East, and then you can see the Harbour Bridge being built, and then 1938 was the Siski, um, 150th anniversary of the landing of the First Fleet. So, um, so, so that's kind of the, the story I put together. Um, whoops, let's go back. Um, and the GIMP. Basically, you, you, you select the photos and GIMP will turn it into that film strip there. Um, and the other thing it also lets you do is the, the mapping. So on each um, image there, so you can click through to that. And I've also got, hopefully it'll work, is there's a link. So you can click on each of those um, images and it'll take you back take you to a bit more of a story about that image. 
Um, so you can get a bit of a sense of what was happening at that time. Um, the GIMP is open source software, so that's pretty standard on um, Linux systems. Um, if you're using something else, there's also a Windows version of the GIMP available. Um, what else is there? Library Hack is, a, um, is the competition, so there's prizes for various, um, oh, there you go, there's the GIMP. <laughs> I decided it wanted to, to tell you about it. Um, and there's quite a few, there's some entries which are quite um, clever. So there's different sections. There's one which is manipulating the data, and then there's um, one which is um, manipulating just photographs. Um, I'm just going to actually... Oh, we've lost the... Oh, here it is. If we go down to entries, um, so different people have done different things with all the old information. So there's quite a few clever ideas. Um, some people have done interactive things. <laughs> you can use, but it was anything as long as you use um, uh, content which has been freely available. So people have done different things on that. Um, the competition actually closes at um, I think at the end of May, so you've probably got three days if you want to <laughs> get in there and do something. I've released mine under um, attribution, share alike, non-commercial. Um, in fact, the library's released it as attribution, share alike. Um, so if you want to have a go at reusing mine, I suppose you can. Um, and, oh yes, I just, so I actually ended up having a bit of a play with the different, um, the different um, things GIMP can do and so that, that was the horizontal version and, it, and GIMP lets you do lots of compression and stuff um, to get it into sort of, so that's about 56k which is quite small. Um, Gimple that it turn it into a vertical um, film strip. In actual fact, what I did for the vertical film strip is actually turned all the images on the side and made it and then inverted it. Um, and it does some cute other things like a spinning globe, <laughs> which is an animation. Um, I think that that's about all. Oh, yeah, that's about all I was going to say. Any questions? Thank you. Who's Shweda? Did you want your laptop back? Why does someone ever use their own laptop? Finally. You don't want my crap top. I don't know if yours will work, James. They just work sometimes. As long as Steve is okay with it. Yeah, that's not what I wanted to see. Uh, uh, can I drag that? Oh, look. Oh. Come on. Okay. To be fair, it's actually VMware that's being naughty this time. Okay. Hey, look. There's a Firefox. Okay. So um, what I wanted to quickly cover was, hopefully by this point you've noticed the new sign-up site that we've been using instead of um, Eventbrite. 
So I just wanted to quickly run over what you can do if you want to help us add more content to the site, or if you know Python, if you want to help us hack on it. Um, there's a couple of prerequisites you'll need. The first is we're currently using Google App Engine, so you'll need the App Engine SDK on your machine. Um, you can get that from code.google.com slash App Engine. Um, you're, we're also hosting the code on GitHub, so you'll need an account on GitHub. You'll also need to have set up Git on your machine. But if you go to help.github.com, they've got awesome guides on um, how you can start get that started. So just follow their process. Um, they have very good documentation. The next thing you'll need to do is actually grab the code. Um, if you go to the site, we've got a link that has get the code, which not surprisingly takes you to our site on GitHub. Um, if you're going to be hacking on it yourself, the easiest thing to do is fork it, make your own copy of the repository so that you can then be pushing changes, get people to comment on the changes, um, and ask for, to, for us to integrate them back into our repo. So if you just click on the get the code link um, from our site, you'll end up on GitHub, fork it, so now you've got your own copy of the code. Um, grab that URL, and if I can find my terminal, Hey. Giant terminal. Git clone that URL that I just pasted. This isn't the cup of tea stage, that comes next. Uh, make serve will not work because I have to change into the folder. MakeServe is going to do a bunch of stuff for you. It downloads a bunch of third-party code that we depend on, um, make packages that up into a zip file, um, and then it starts up the App Engine SDK server for you. So once it says that it started up, this is where you make the tea. This is a, a one-time only thing. Uh, the make file is smart enough to be able to detect that you've already downloaded all the pre prerequisites, nothing's changed. So in future, when you do make serve, it takes five seconds to start up. Well, I wanted to show that it is simple and fast and only requires one cup of tea. <laughs> Isn't, wasn't the cheese delicious? And the quiche. Yes. It's not the weekends that bother me. It's the, the nights I get home from work, and I sit down to just do a quick thing, and suddenly it's 3 a.m., and yeah. I've got to go to work in the morning. You can borrow some of my kids. That'll help. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's faster if you're on a proper internet link. It's a dodgy free Wi-Fi. Yes, of course. So you'll see it right down there, running application on port 8080. So if I switch back to my browser, that one, yep. Localhost colon 8080. If I type that correctly, this is the version running on my own machine. And you'll notice there are, I did actually run this before, so I've already got one event created. But because it's running on your own machine, you can go to slash event slash admin, and you can become an admin on your own instance. So you can play around with the back end and see what the features are there. Uh, where do I go? Back to the terminal. So I'm just going to kill that for a second. Um, we have a bunch of content on the existing slug, slug website. If we can copy that content across to this site, this can become the only site that we've got um, because we don't need all the features that the other side has. So I, in here, you'll see there's a file called, off to the left of the screen for me. Is it up there? Yeah, wait, that's it. Maybe I haven't actually pushed it yet. Okay. No, there was, a, there was a file I made but have not pushed, which was my fault. Um, but we've got some templates in there. Um, it's easy enough to hack those templates. If you look at uh, map.html is the simplest. Um, you can see there's a little bit of stuff up here at the top that in 
just says incorporate from the base, and then you can whack in the underneath whatever content you want. And then if you go back to the site, um, it's set up so that that was called map.html. So if you go to slash map, ugh, I can't see what I typed. That looks correct to me. What have you done, Tim? Yeah. Oh, stupid me. I stopped the server so I could show you things. Make serve. Start it up again. There we go. Once it actually loads up again. There we go. So yeah, uh, if you can copy that template, you can put in other content. Um, so a really simple and easy way to help us out would be to clone this, grab content inside the existing site, put it into a file in here. Once you're done, you can go back to your terminal and again, GitHub has really good instructions for you to follow on the process of pushing the content back. But the short version is you run git commit locally, git push sends it back up to the server and then back on GitHub from your fork, you can send a pull request. That will let us know that you've done some code that you'd like us to accept. We can look at it, we can have a discussion with you, and if we decide it's suitable, we can just accept it back into the main repository. Um, while you're on the website, you can also be looking at... Uh, we are using the issue tracker on GitHub. So there's a bunch of open issues for things that we know that need fixing. Um, if you see bugs or you can see features that you'd like added or things like that, feel free to open an issue. Or if you want to hack on something, pick one of the issues and start fixing it. That, maybe that's for everybody. As Nick already knows, he's already given us the <laughs> <laughs> Yep, so the, the layout that's there and the functionality that's there at the moment, it came from Tim and I hacking here on a couple of weekends a little bit of feedback from Patrick and from Nick and a few other people. Um, it's, it's quite rough. It's, you know, stuff we whack together in a hurry. So feedback is good. That's all, I think. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Roger. Roger. I should stand where people can see me. So I did prepare some slides, and there is a lovely video on YouTube, but so all you need to do is type into your handy search engine um, world IPv6 day or running out of IPv4 addresses, and there's a great little Cisco one you can see. <clears throat> but essentially what's happening on June 8th is the well, world is getting together to do a grand, large-scale, internet-scale collaboration test of, world, of IPv6. And a number of very high-profile websites are going to turn their front doors on to IPv6. And those very high, well, a few of those include uh, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Akamai, Limelight. And there's, if you go to our own website, so if you could just helpfully type in and put this on the screen, www.ipv6.org.au. IPv6.org.au. And that is the Internet Society of Australia's web page dedicated to IPv6 resources. Uh, from there, we have a bunch of folks who locally are happy to help you, either for free or for a fee, depending on how big the job is and what you want to do. But we've got links there to sites that can helpfully provide you with tunnels. Um, I can't read that screen from here properly either, so I can't tell you what to click next. But just go there. <laughs> Explore for yourselves. <laughs> um, so the idea is that on, on June 8th, and it is uh, UTC or GMT <laughs> um, day, so it starts at 10 a.m. here in Sydney, um, Australian Eastern Standard Time, so I do get to sleep in kind of sort of that day, and it goes through to, well, midday Western Australian time the next day um, for us. But it's, it's June 8th worldwide. And the idea is that basically people everywhere should be turning IPv6 on, 
getting out there using stuff. Now, we've, we've been compiling long lists of folks that are already delivering content via IPv6. Uh, Google are also actively participating in developing more measurement tools and, and application systems, as are a lot of other people throughout the world. We'll be actively measuring how much traffic we see, the types of behaviour that we see across the world, and reporting on that subsequently. I've got to organise an event sometime, somehow, within the next few, <laughs> few uh, weeks after World IPv6 Day to try and report back on the sorts of things that we're seeing over here in Australia and also be uh, working with other chapters of ISOC uh, around the world. That's the Internet Society. I suppose I should have started this talk with a brief introduction to the Internet Society, but I sort of assumed I was amongst friends and you know how to spell RFC. Um, Oops. <laughs> um, uh, ISOC AU has decided to coordinate the activities within Australia for those who want to participate you know, with the Internet Society um, in World IPv6 Day. So if you want to contribute some more, i.e. throw up a website, throw up some content or help your own folks get IPv6 enabled, happy to help out if you need it. So go to the website, send me an email at vice-president vice at ISOC dash au dot org dot au um, or do something different <laughs> but do let us know if you want to participate because we we are uh, it's good to know who's participating and who's not right now i have a number of isps within australia who are happy to tell me what they're doing but they're not re yet ready to go public now I'm trying to coax them to go public <laughs> after they have the nice heartwarming chat with me about how easy it really is. I'm trying to coax them into going public, but they're not. A lot of them are just not ready to go public. So while we have um, content providers such as Akamai globally turning on IPv6, and a significant number of Australian content distributors actually distribute via Akamai. At this stage, I'm still trying to, you know, coax out of them whether or not they are delivering their content via IPv6 or not. Tell and the same it. with, um, it yeah. Makes them sound very modern, up to date. It does. It does. It does. Yeah. And so, what are the gotchas that we're expecting? We are expecting some sort of gotchas. Well, actually, we're hoping that nothing bad happens at all. But chances are, stuff will go wrong. Um, some one of the little things that one of the things that I have seen happen is that if people have got IPv6 working on their local LAN, but their their path isn't right all the way through to the IPv6 enabled site. So they do a DNS lookup, they get a quad A record, and the thing says, yep, there's an IPv6 site out there at the address you just typed. And I'm IPv6, so therefore I should see it. Some machines, some, some browsers don't fail back to IPv4 if the path is not complete. So normally when you type in a URL and the network is there, and there's a path there, you get there and you get the page. But with what we're seeing with some browsers, if they're running a dual stack system, you type in the IP, you type in the, the, the web address, you get back an IPv6 address and your machine can't make that path all the way through. It doesn't fail back to IPv4. So that's what happens with some machines. My Ubuntu Linux doesn't have that problem, it's fine. <laughs> um, I have heard some people with BSD have that problem. Old versions of Apple, uh, I can't remember which particular version. So if people can find extra versions and hiccups, please do tell me and I'll add them to the list and we can propagate that. Um, question up the back. Um, are you expecting tunnel brokers to be crushed by video traffic, potentially? Maybe. Yeah, that could be. They could be, but so perhaps one should go natively if one can. <laughs> <laughs> I have also been trying to coax additional universities around the country to um, fire up their own uh, networks within IP with IPv6. Arnet has been IPv6 enabled for years. A number of the universities around um, Australia are not IPv6 enabled, yet their equipment is capable of it. The uh, folks are capable of turning it on and operating it, but for some reason a lot of universities have been hesitant over the last few years, and I, I'm not going to go down the path there of repeating any of the nonsense I've heard about why and where, wherefore not. Um, but we live in hope. <laughs> any other uh, question? I haven't. Uh, there was a Firefox version. I've been using Firefox, it's just fine, again. Um, no, I don't have that list. There, there are lists around the place on the net and I'm trying to find a good authoritative one before I link to it on our site. 
Um, there might be a new link to it from uh, World IPv6 Day at isop.org. So I, I see we've got up there the page from the Internet Society Globally's um, page on World, World IPv6 Day. Was there another question? Nope. Great. Thanks, folks. And I hope to see you on IPv6 on, uh, well, later today. <laughs>
And the last reason is IPv4, you need to use NAT. You, it's simply because there's not enough IPv4s to go around, you have to use NAT. Um, the obvious bits and pieces of IPv4, IPv6 is that there's 128 bit address space. That means that uh, typically your f first 48 bits is going to be controlled by your ISP, which means you have that many allocations available to businesses. Uh, the red zero there marks the population of the Earth. So the six billion, that's where the population of the Earth is. And um, if you're going for personal IP, your ISP will control the first 64 bits, which will leave you that many allocations available. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Um, the less obvious bits of that IPv6 is that there's more efficiency in it. Because the header is a fixed length, the routers don't have to read as much detail into it. They don't have to, it's not as complicated to code for the routers. So it's a lot, uh, simplifies the header processing. Uh, fixed address length, again, goes to simplify the routing. You know that the uh, first 64 bits uh, is your routing. Your next 64 bits is the individual machine. You know that this, the, from 48 bit to 64 bit is your subnet, so it's, it's simplifies it all around. Uh, and of course you've got direct connection to any machine and they also dropped the, dropped the checksum out of IPv6 because nobody was really using it. Then why bother calculating it? Whoops. Alright. So this is just a comparison of the headers. On the left here you have the IPv4 header and on the right, the IPv6, you can see a lot of the, uh, the headed fields have been marked in different colours according to whether they're being kept or not. So the ones in yellow are uh, kept from IPv6 to v4. The ones in red are not kept, they're just being dumped. And let me see if I can go to full screen or something. Uh, how do I do this? Uh, that'll do. All right. And the, the ones that are in blue, the names have changed or positions moved, but basically they're still there. And the green is new. Hello. Let's try this. Right. Was that one page or two? One. Good. So as I was saying, the header is a fixed length in IPv6. So the header doesn't change length, but they have what they call extensible headers. So instead of in IPv4, you have different options within the header. To simplify things, they now have just the heads, the IPv6 header on its own, and you have additional headers as needed. Uh, they mandate what order those headers are coming in. So a router header, for example, obviously the router is going to be looking at that, so you want it quite early on. And you may or may not have a TCP header, of course, so it's, that's not too much different from IPv4. It's just the fact that it's no longer integrated into the IPv4 header, uh, they've separated it out so the IPv6 header is simple and straightforward. <laughs> Alright, so this is just the basics of the address scheme and as you can see the, uh, you've got 128 bits, the first 48 bits is just the routing to your area. The next 16 bits is your subnet. So instead of having variable lengths of subnet, it's all going to be in that 16 bits. And the last bit is the interface ID. So that's usually generated automatically based on the MAC address of the machine, which every machine has. Uh, and so that's what I meant, that comes into play in, in the auto configuration of the IP address. Uh, so you can see they've got the sections divided up according to who's got control over it. So you've got the regional registry, ISPs, and then you've got the site prefix. So if you're a business, you'll get, your ISP will give you this, and you'll be able to control this bit to control your different subnets within your organisation. Um, and of course the last 64 bits is the interface ID of your machine. Can I move? No. Right, so this is an example IP address. Uh, the first one, 
all three of those IP addresses are exactly the same. The first one is just the long form, spelling out every single digit. To obviously write in that many bits is very tedious. So first thing they've done is they've kind of a, converted it to hex. They're not using a, fix, uh, a decimal number anymore, so that simplifies it. And the second of all, the next line down, they've knocked off all the zeros of the beginning of each of those sections. So basically, instead of writing four zeros, you write one zero. Instead of writing zero zero AB, you now write AB. So you can abbreviate it quite a fair bit. The last one, basically when you've got two columns together, it means that all the fields between there, between the, the first section here and the next section there, are zero. You can only do that once within the address because if you do it more than once, you can't sort of recreate what the full number was. Um, there are reserved IP addresses, just like in IPv4. Uh, you, of course, have your unspecified address. In IPv4, you quite often specify an, an unspecified IP for your default gateway and that sort of thing as 0, 0, 0, 0. The same thing in IPv6, it's just all zeros, or the, in the abbreviated form, column, column, 0, slash 128. So the loopback address is just 0, 0, 0, all the way 1. So your loopback address is, instead of being 127.0.0.1, it's now just all zeros and one at the end. Um, you also have a number of different addresses. You have your link local address. So that basically means all the, uh, all the interfaces that are on the same link as me. You have your site local, which has been deprecated. Uh, and you have multicast, which IPv4 has multicast as well. And if my James, <laughs> password, please. Okay. It's back. So multicast is used in IPv4 too. It's just that in IPv6, all multicast addresses begin with FF00 slash eight, so that's the first, what would that be? That would be the first FF bit. Um, you also have a, note, a concept of anycast, which is basically you can have multiple machines of the same IP address, and any of those machines will answer, whichever machine is nearest. So here we have some more predefined addresses, just spelled out a little bit more detailed. Uh, so you have if you wanted to talk to all the nodes within your, within your link, you would just put it F2, FF02 colon colon 1, and you'd be broadcasting to all the nodes within your, within your link. You can also broadcast specifically to all the routers within your link, etc. So instead of doing, uh, they don't do broadcast like they do in IPv4, where you talk to all the machines of a, of a subnet, you can, you basically have these, uh, predefined multicast addresses instead. So in IPv6, they've added quite a few to the uh, ICMP messages. ICMP is used for things like ping and error codes coming back to your router or back from your router. Um, they've added a fair bit to this. Uh, you now have a neighbor discovery, which replaces ARP. ARP was a bit of a attack on. Uh, it's it crosses boundaries about which protocol it's talking through to set up, uh, your, find out your local thing, your local, uh, your, uh, a particular IP on your network. Whereas neighbor, dis neighbor discovery works purely on the IP level. Uh, you have router solicitation ad advertisement, so that's used instead of DHCP. Uh, duplicate address discovery, so if you've predefined, if you've auto uh, configured your IP address, you can test that nobody else on your network has that same IP address. Uh, multicast listening is also being put in, so it's no longer a, it's a separate uh, protocol. In IPv4 it was IGMP, which is a, almost a separate pro protocol. Now it's part of the IPv6 standard. Uh, it, in IPv6, if you're sending packets, uh, if you're sending packets larger than 120, 1,280 bytes long, you have to auto-negotiate basically. 
And that does that by basically sending the larger packet. If there's no errors, I'm good to use that larger packet. If I send a larger packet and I get an error, I try a smaller packet. So basically it's using the ICMP error code coming back, it can sort of figure out how large a packet it can send. <laughs> um, I'm trying to rush through this a little bit fast here. You also have additional ICMP messages related to mobile IP. No, <laughs> James. <laughs> I'll try to move the mouse more often. It's telling me I'm going too slow. Yeah, it's, it did that last time. It's going to come back. There it is. All right. So you have additional messages related to mobile IP. Mobile IP existed in IPv4 as well, but it was a bit of a tack on, <laughs> like a lot of stuff. Uh, all the IP, IP, ICMP v4 functionality remains the same. So the error codes that exist in IPv4 are the same in IPv6. Where's my mask on? Right, so auto negotiation. Auto configuration, I should say. Um, so first of all, when your machine turns on, you have the link local address. And you automatically calculate your interface ID and you tack it on the end of the link local address and that's going to be your, your particular machine's link local address. Uh, it typically uses the MAC address to figure out what its uh, uh, interface ID is going to be. You can use a random number instead uh, or temp IP if you want. They added that option to try to encourage people to, uh, you know, some people are concerned with anonymity on the internet. Uh, you then do a duplicate address detection. If you find that there's no duplicate address, you're free to use it. If you find that you're not unique, well, you stop there and you don't do anything more. So as not to interfere with what's what. Oh. Once you've got the uh, link local address, you then move on to the next step. You can either have a stateful configuration where you're doing something like DHCP or a manual configuring of the IP address. This address, this address that's calculated in this second half here is going to be totally separate to the link local. Even if you have an IPv6 address, you'll still have the link local address as well. So you'll have the two. Always ha have at least the link local address. And the other option there is, of course, with a state, stateless autoconfig where it will basically send out a uh, router solicitation and the router will, rep will reply, will rep reply that um, this is my prefix and this is my you know, default gateway and all the other bits and pieces that, that it needs. And it'll use that prefix in front of its standard interface ID. So it'll keep the same interface ID as the ID as the link local, it'll just have the router's prefix as the router had described it. Um, so, mouse. sorry? Mouse. Move mouse, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's no router ad advertisement returned, it just assumes that I, he's the only machine on the network and just sticks with the link local address. Um, so it's step three, yeah, multiple. You can, it can actually return multiple prefixes and you'll just get multiple IP defined. It's no problem with having more than one IP address defined. Uh, the router advertisement can also be used to move the IP addresses around or update them because basically as well as you don't just get a router advertisement when you send a router solicitation you also get periodic router advertisements. So the router advertisement will say, this advertisement is good for the next 10 minutes, next hour, whatever it's got to find. And it would expect a new router advertisement every whatever it was defined. Uh, so at, if you wanted to move the whole network over to a different IP range, all you'd have to do is say, send out another router advertisement. This router advertisement is good for one minute. And when it expires, they'll just do, well, I haven't got a router advertisement recently. I'll have to do another router solicitation and the whole thing renews. Uh, there ha into working with IPv4, from what I've heard, is going to be a little bit problematic. Uh, mainly because they, these, 
these standards were drawn up at a time when they thought we would be on IPv6, IP, IPv6 already, and obviously we are not. Uh, so you have what they call an IPv4 compatible address, which basically is just uh, all zeros and the IP address. You can write it as, like I've got here, with all zeros 139.1.1.1.2.21. Or you can write it as colon column 8B01, which is basically the same, just in hex. Uh, you need the compatible IP address if you want to do the tunnels automatically. Otherwise, you have to do the tunnels manually and set them up. And the tunneling is set up the same way as we tunnel ATM over IP or IPX over IP. It's the same sort of deal. Uh, and of course, the auto setup has to be set up. There is something new that I saw on some of the more recent uh, information on the net called NAT PT or NAT protocol translation, which works similar to NAT. You have your IPv6 come in. Uh, so you could set it up manually and say this IPv6 always translates to this IPv4 address, or you can do it dynamically like most rat NAT routers do already on IPv4. So for those who don't understand what NAT does, basically you have an IPv4 edge, you have your local IP network, and when something tries to go out to the big internet world, it puts it on your outgoing IP address, sends the message out, and when the message comes back, it remembers which one sent the message to where and converts it back to the local IP, net IP network. So this works in a similar sort of way, only your local IP network is now IPv6. So you have an outgoing IPv6 message, it's given a temporary IPv4 message, that goes out, can't, when the message comes back, it remembers, oh, yes, that's the one that came from this particular IPv6 IPv6 machine, so it converts it back to that address and sends a message on. Um, there is a fair bit... I know IPv4 had IP, um, IP mobility, but there were a lot of limitations to it. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. This is the last, second last slide. Um, so basically, f just a quick rundown on what I IP mobility is. You have your mobile device that's on your local home network. You take that mobile device out of your home network and it'll try to configure itself to whatever network is that it's local to now. So you're at McDonald's or some other business or whatever and it configures the local IP address same as it would normally, it then informs the home network of its current, net lo current location. Then you have two possibilities. If, you, if someone tries to contact that mobile device on a home network, the home network will basically say, forward those messages on. So it'll, figure, it'll create a tunnel from the home network to where the mobile device currently is and any messages coming to the home network for that mobile device will then be tunneled over to wherever it currently is in another country, whatever. The other way to do it, or in addition to that, the, the advantage of doing it that way is that it's transparent. The device doesn't, the machine that's trying to talk to the mobile device doesn't need to know anything about IP mobility. The other way requires that the machine talking to the mobile device does know something about IP mobility. So it works in the same way, except that when the message finally gets through to the mobile device, the mobile device will send the message directly back to the, to the machine trying to talk to it and say, actually, don't worry about talking about going to my home network anymore. I'm actually currently located over here. And all further messages will go direct. And of course, the machine will then keep up to date on... Uh, I tried to get it. And now a couple of seconds later, there we go. And of course, the machine will try to keep it up to date on where it's currently located. It can actually register two separate mobile locations. So the idea is that if, I, if your mobile device is registered and say you're on a border of two companies or whatever, then you would register through both companies 
and when your machine, when the machine tries to con when some foreign machine tries to contact your mobile device, it'll send a message to both those those uh, local areas. So it'll get it from two different, the same message from both locations. That means that when it does finally move over to one, it's more quicker and less of a delay. So the big advantages with IPv6 and mobility is that it, they've done a lot of improvement to it. So because the destination extensible header provides additional info, it obviously makes it easier to negotiate these things. The router extensible header can be used for simple tunneling rather than doing the old IPv4 tunneling, which is more complicated to set up. Uh, auto configuration means that the, when your mobile device comes up online on the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The foreign agents network, it can automatically configure rather than something a little bit more complicated and have to be known on that device, that network, et cetera. Uh, you have better dynamic home agent address discovery. That's basically to do with the fact that you've now got the uh, Anycast address. So you don't have to broadcast, if you've got more than one home agent on your home network, you don't have to broadcast to all of them and get multiple messages back. You can do the Anycast and it's a little bit simpler. Uh, you also got the route optimization. Uh, that could be done on IPv4, but it was required additional hacks. And now it's part of the IPv6 standard. And the big, one of the big points is that it's now independent of the layer two network. IPv4 had to work on Ethernet. With IPv6, it can work on any network. So mobile networks are now more feasible. Uh, you also have the mobile extensibility header, which increases, which is for the mobile uh, route optimization messages, is now uh, part of the IPv6 standard. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> that was a bit of a race. Any questions? Will the other presenters have their own laptop? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what we're going to do is Mark's going to go over to next week yep. and John's going to do his. Nah, thanks, John. Do you want this still? Okay, we're holding over uh, the Emacs and keyboards talk to next week. Um, out the front here, we've got I've got some keyboards to give away. <laughs> these are uh, these ones are, have triple the number of uh, function keys that normally. They're actually a very nice Keytronics keyboard. Um, I, I was going to cover that in the in the talk about why you need more keyboards. The other thing I've got is uh, I've got some uh, GPS rec receivers here. Uh, these put out. Uh, these are a U-Box uh, ones. They're quite a nice. Uh, U-Box are a, a quite a nice company. Uh, these put out a pulse per second signal, uh, which is useful for NTP and timekeeping. That's also something that uh, we covered in a, a future talk. Um, I've got a talk coming up uh, on NTP and using GPS. So, if anyone w wants to play with them before time, I've got a couple here. Um, All right, uh, Mark, thanks very much. I, I'm someone who will not be relying on overheads at all, so uh, hopefully uh, ho ho hopefully it'll be something something that you can go with. Now, what are we? We're at about uh, nine, a little past nine. I'll hopefully finish a little past a quarter past, and if people want to ask questions, I will go to the pub afterwards if you want, want, want to do that. So, uh, but um, I... Uh, I, I, I guess uh, I, I think I said before, uh, going back ten or more years, the, the last substantial talk I gave that was at Slug quite some time ago. Um, I know Grant Parnell uh, back then was you know, quite quite appreciative of that. I guess it, it's sad that, that Grant's not here to to actually see. I guess another talk by me. Now I'm talking about open source and ethics, and. Uh, I suppose one of the things that a lot of us get involved is in is what you might call a moral struggle. Uh, it's sort of looking at the world and trying to understand, you know, injustice in the world and the way things go wrong. And uh, you know, for uh, for some of us, that's a that's quite an intense journey that takes us uh, quite some time. 
And I suppose because the moral struggle is about ethics, um, you know, the idea of open source making the world a better place is, you know, something that I've reflected on a bit. Um, now, I'm president of the uh, New South Wales Humanist, so I guess I've had a, a journey that's involved ethics and, and, and atheism and that sort of thing. And, I mean, obviously I haven't quite an interest in religion. I mean, religion provides us with creation stories, but they're not just about the physical world. Uh, they're talking about the origin of evil in the world and, and where it comes from. And, I mean, the humanistic or atheistic approach is sort of looking at, you know, the nature of these things in the world. And I've had that moral struggle. I've, you know, incorporated things from uh, ethical philosophy, you know, atheism, you know, economics, game theory, you know, evolutionary psychology, those sorts of things, in an attempt to try to make sense of the world. Um, and apart from the humanists, I'll just make a little bit of an advertisement before I go on of the stuff that I'm up to. I'm also involved in, or I run the Sydney Shove, which is an economics and politics discussion group. On Tuesday, we have a talk on uh, Islam, science and causality. That's on Tuesday, if you want to look that up. Um, I also do poetry and spoken word with the Caravan Slam group. And uh, I do one-day courses in science at the WEA. So I invite you to have a look at them. But getting back to open source, open source sits in a context which is our society and our society has an economy uh, and our economy is a bit of an ambiguous institution that's open to much debate and interpretation. And we, we heard Sridhar talk about uh, you know, how, how, how the, the market isn't looking at the smaller things that are going on, valuable things. So it's, uh, it's sort of an ambiguous institution. But I think open source also has some con contradictions of its own, some tensions. I, I think one of them is between cooperation and, uh, and uh, n uh, basically individualism. So if, if we look at the economy, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, look at the economy, there's this competition, competition results in marvellous things. And I guess there's also competition in open source. And that's, I think, a bit of a, a contradiction. We've got cooperation. We've also got the fact that open source is supposed to unleash our individualism and our individual creativity. So I think there's, there's a bit of a tension there. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we relate to individualism as compared to cooperation and competition? So talking about uh, our economic system. Okay, I might pause here. <laughs> Okay, all right. Okay, well, any, anyway, we have um, economic exchange, but uh, anthropologists tell us that that's not the only way of allocating and distributing tasks in society. We have communal sharing, which is undifferentiated within a group. I guess that's more what we have in open source. Um, we have authority ranking, where higher status people get more. We have equality matching, which is sort of people exchanging gifts. I guess that's what happens at Christmas. Um, if you go back to the Roman Empire, people would build public buildings and donate them to the, sort of the people overall. So uh, I guess there was competition to give gifts. And then you have market pricing, where favours are exchanged according to a proportionality. You know, I guess we measure that with money. So... Um, so I suppose one of the things, I guess I'll be talking a little bit about economics and ho hopefully it'll fit into open source, but Keith Hart, an anthropologist who looks into money, he's got a very interesting comment on the way we relate to the economy. This modern religion is similar in many ways to older claims made on behalf of God. If society is omniscient and good, how can there be so much suffering in the world? And uh, that's a promise of the economy that left to ourselves to pursue our own interests, we'll all be better off. And to be sure, a lot of what we consume is provided by that economy. Um, I'll even go so far as to say production of stuff by firms and the consumptions by ourselves can be a creative and ethical exercise, but I'll stop short of saying that it's always going to be the case. I guess your apologists for capitalism are going to claim that's the case most of the time. And we wonder whether people are playing by the rules vigorously or they're actually trying to work outside the rules. And I think that's one of the contradictions with, uh, with, with, it, with the economy, that there's all these firms that are supposed to apply themselves vigorously but not illegally. And then, you know, there's the in-between of something that is legal but isn't ethical. 
and you know you get lots of stories of firms doing something that's quite dodgy but it's not actually illegal and um, you know that's you I, I suppose perhaps some of you are aware of stories where some firm tries to claim some intellectual property right and there's this revolt amongst consumers or people on the internet and say no that's not right we don't care what the law is saying um, so you're seeing the difference between uh, law and et laws and ethics and we have environmental impact and waste. Now, some of those things that we're producing are including computers, which must eventually end up as landfill. I suppose they're supposed to be recycled, but um, I don't know. I look around and I still have this, this sort of sick feeling in my stomach as I, as, as I think about it, and perhaps you do as well. But these are the computers upon which we're going to run our open source software. If we're going to say that open source is a good thing to have, then we must also, by implication, say that um, it's a good thing to have computers out there in the world. Computers that are provided by the regular market economy, while open source software uh, is provided through that collaboration. Now, I'm ignoring uh, open source hardware. I don't know if you've heard the stories about 3D printers and cottage factories making lots of cute things. Well, I'm, we're talking mostly about the world we see around us, rather than going off on too many tangents. Now, a fundamental issue is that we need corporations to make our computers which our better open source software runs on. But how is it we say that open source software is superior to some elements of the capitalist economy, while at other times we rely on the capitalist economy without blinking for other things? For, you know, for like the veggies we're going to buy from the, from the, from the local uh, grocer. So economics, though, if we want to look at that, does actually say, look, Monopolies, uh, people who abuse information, firms that abuse information is bad. That's you know a bad thing from the economic point of view. But you know there's also some people who try to say that the economy is nasty, mean, and we have to forgive it. Schumpeter has a process of saying that the economy is a process of creative destruction. In other words, there's got there's got to be a bit unfair. Um, there's got to be a grit, bit of grit going on there for things to actually advance. So there's. Another way, though, that we can actually criticise firms that aren't using uh, aren't use, using open source software, separately to them being monopolies, and that's to say that they're getting in the way of the progressive development of open source code. We don't criticise other firms because they're not getting in the way of something productive. But we're now not criticising those firms because they're particularly different to other firms. We're only criticising them of where we find them, and so we're not able to say that they're in some way evil or different to other firms, it's just that they, they live in a different pond. And I think if you think about that, it is going to be a struggle to actually criticise um, firms that, that do use closed source software at the same time as we might acknowledge good things that the rest of the economy does. Now, but having looked at open source and the economy, what about open source software itself? Um, you know, if you look at the cathedral, there are various models that say, look, open source software is going to be better. And, you know, maybe it's going to be cheaper. And uh, that's, that, that's something there. Like, basically, if we say things are cheaper, is that so, so good? There are some problems you have if you actually look at world trade when the price of crops declines. It's good for people who eat the crops, but it's bad for the people, for the farmers who make them. You know, basically price, price is a bit more complicated than that. So, um, you know, basically maybe it's the fact that people are cooperating and that's a good in itself. Um, but, you know, basically when we look at the output, is this output better than the alternative? And when you look at things being cheaper, you know, sometimes I wonder about this incessant desire for things to be cheaper. Will things ever get sufficiently cheap that they don't need to get any cheaper? In other words, it's always a, a continuous slide. It's, it's, you, you never actually reach that goal where things are cheap enough. So um, through, through this, uh, we can see that there's something wrong with the world. Broadly speaking, firms are making money through closed source software and monopolistic practices, and the world would be a better place if open source were more prevalent. So, but the other thing is, if we look at these, these things, we can say, look, there's an injustice, here's a problem. But how does it compare to other injustices? Because open source does sit, sit in a broader world. Um, you know, we have the sins of globalisation, tin pock dictatorships in third world countries, workplace bullies, 
and say tax systems that uh, disadvantage carers. You know, we can make a big, big list of them. So in one sense, how I mean, I used to get very emotional about, you know, the, the ethics of open source, and I guess I do still do to some extent. But when you look at all the other injustices in the world, how does that compare? I, I think a conclusion that you can make is that it's wrong to say that it has some bigger significance, some grander significance, some universal significance. But at the same time, there's never anything wrong with trying to, in our own small corner of the world, to try to make that world a better place. we just got to, I guess, keep things in proportion. Now, I suppose, I think I've skipped a few things that I would have otherwise said. There's a lot of things that I wouldn't mind saying if I had the time, you know, the nature of ownership, the nature of property ownership, uh, the nature of intellectual property. Um, you know, these are things that I guess I've also thought about over time and how that fits into the economy. But um, I hope you found what I have to say interesting. I can only say from my own point of view, if only I'd heard someone say the sort of things I'm saying now 10 or 20 years ago. Well, I would have, I would have sa saved such a journey to get where I am now. But uh, in any case, I, I, I hope, I hope you found what I've had to say interesting. Maybe I'll, I'll have a chance to sort of say more at another stage. Uh, I have to say, Mark, thank you very much for succeeding this time here. I guess I, I also go. In one of my other activist interests, I also go cycling, and I have to make a choice about what I'm doing on the last Friday of the month. So thank you.